Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the IEEE Young Professionals uh, uh, webinar series. Um, today we have uh, Nagy Negathran um, from uh, uh, from LSI Corp, a uh, principal engineer. He's going to be talking us uh, today on how to be a, a star engineer. Uh, <clears throat> uh, welcome to the Young Professional uh, webinar series. Uh, my name is Matthew. Uh, Carius, I'm the uh, webinar specialist for the um, MGA Young Professionals uh, uh, Board. Uh, I'm also the vice chair of the uh, Young uh, of the Toronto Young Professionals uh, Affinity Group. Uh, uh, and in case you haven't known or noticed, uh, I Triple Young Professionals will be hosting uh, monthly webinars in 2014 and hopefully into uh, 2015 on uh, effective communication, leadership, and uh, uh, many more uh, ideas to come. <coughs> um, so participating in the actual uh, webinar, please during the webinar, please type any questions you have into the uh, question box uh, below. Uh, vote for your questions that appear, and all questions will be answered uh, either during the webinar or uh, following the webinar during a five-minute Q&A session. And uh, in case you haven't noticed, the, the questions from our previous webinar are, are, are still up. Uh, not to worry. You can still post and vote for your questions as they do appear uh, chronologically. So we will uh, still be able to get through all the questions uh, asked of, of, of us today. Uh, new name, new field. Uh, uh, Gold uh, have, uh, has been rebranded to IEEE Young Professionals. So we were pre previously called uh, the graduates of the last decade affinity group. Uh, we have now rebranded ourselves to uh, IEEE Young Professionals as the IEEE Gold uh, name or brand was not instantly recognized as a young professional group. Uh, new name makes it easier to um, easier to find information and benefits uh, for uh, relevant IEEE Young Professionals. And uh, the brand has been uh, extremely successful in the last uh, uh, year um, or a year or so. Um, uh, we've had a networking mixer in Toronto with over 150 attendees, and uh, the Central Texas uh, uh, section had a mixer at the International South by Southwest Festival, which again was a great success. Um, uh, please join us on our Gold Rush blog to see uh, exciting news uh, uh, related to IEEE Young Professionals. Uh, connect with us online. We are uh, offering two new career-based services to IEEE Young Professionals, the first being a mentor center where we actually link up uh, young professionals with uh, uh, mentors in uh, various fields, so please uh, join us there. And, of course, the IEEE Resume Lab is a great tool to actually enhance your resume when applying for uh, jobs. Uh, connect and follow us online. Uh, we have our website there, our email, Facebook group, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and, of course, our YouTube page where all our webinars will be posted. Uh, uh, please uh, join up. Please like our Facebook group as we are doing uh, uh, weekly IEEE uh, Young Professional Members, uh, where we highlight uh, a, a, a weekly uh, IEEE Young Professional Member uh, in terms of the successes that he or she has has has, has done. <clears throat> so today's webinar, like I mentioned before, is how to be a star engineer. Uh, Nagy Negathran. Um, uh, is the principal engineer at LISI Corp. Uh, he's also actively involved in IEEE in terms of the uh, uh, IEEE Princeton Central Jersey section. Uh, he's also an uh, adjunct professor at the Department of VC at Rutgers University uh, in New Jersey. He has over 25 years of experience, and I'm, I'm looking forward to um, uh, listening to what he has to talk about, about how to be a, a star engineer. So, uh, uh, Nagy, please, uh, please uh, go ahead with your webinar, and, and thanks for joining us. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, can you hear me well, uh, Matt? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Matt. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to you and also uh, Mario of the IEEE Young Professionals uh, for arranging this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, how does you know one transition from an electrical engineer to an electrifying engineer, or you know, for that matter, a mechanical engineer to be a magnificent engineer. Or uh, in other words, you know, how do we transition from being an engineer to becoming a star engineer? So that's what my today's presentation is going to be. They say that you know today's preparation determines tomorrow's success. So I would like to share uh, some ninja tricks for becoming a star engineer or a great engineer. 
and this is what uh, my agenda uh, looks like. Uh, so a lot of you, I assume, are young professionals. Uh, unfortunately, I don't, you know, fit in that category. Um, but I do want to point out, you know, when we transition from a school world to the industry universe, you know, what happens really? And then, you know, we always talk about stars. So who is really a star? Uh, you know, what are really the steps or trades to achieve that stardom? Uh, so along the way, I would like to you know, present some anecdotes and also personal experiences in developing some of these trades to achieve that stardom. And finally, you know, I will conclude with a summary uh, listing some of the trades which could be helpful uh, to become a star engineer. Uh, one of the references I do want to point out here, uh, which is by uh, Robert Kelly, uh, he he wrote a book you know, called How to Be a Star at Work. Uh, in fact, he did a survey of uh, many companies, actually. He did that probably in late 80s, and uh, this book came out uh, in 90s, where he interviewed people from several companies, uh, such as AT&T, IBM, and all other big companies, followed many people. Uh, uh, their career paths, and then he tried to come up with, you know, what are really some of the traits that successful engineers had. So he had actually several case studies uh, listing some of these things. Uh, so some of the things I have taken uh, from his work, and then others are, you know, based on my personal experience. Also, I do want to put a, uh, you know, standard uh, disclaimer. I mean, the presentation here. Uh, reflects you know, only my personal views and experiences and they're not of my company. Also, I do want to point out, I mean, uh, Matt, thanks for your kind introduction. Uh, by, when I send the uh, the abstract, we were LSI Corporation, um, but now you know, we've become Awago. Uh, Awago Technologies uh, bought LSI a couple of months ago. So, so now I, I work for uh, Awago. So when we hear the word, you know, engineers, you know, who comes to mind? I mean, engineers are the ones, you know, who solve problems. So from, since I'm from New Jersey, you know, I do have to put, you know, the great engineers from New Jersey. Uh, of course, you know, the first one is, uh, you know, Thomas Edison, the great engineer. And then the other three are uh, the transistor inventors, you know, Bardeen, Bratton, and Shockley. So when we talk about engineers, you know, how can we talk about engineers without talking about Dilbert? I'll kind of let you um, look at uh, Dilbert's view, and hopefully, you know, we don't feel that way. So when we transition from a student to a technology professional, you know, what are some of the changes that we run into? You know, one is when we are in school, I mean, it is mostly individual. Uh, you know, everything depends on the grade and the type of work one individual does. Whereas, you know, when you enter the industry, it becomes more of a team-oriented approach. So it is all about the team and not just the individual. And then when we are in school, it's mostly you know, solving very interesting problems, whereas the reality in the industry is totally different. It's how you know, we can increase the bottom line. And then if we are in grad school, of course, you know, it all depends on how many papers we can publish. Uh, whereas in the old days, in the industry, I mean, a lot of people were publishing, but now it's all about products, and then how many patents we can have. Of course, another thing in the university or in, in, in the school is, you know, how do we please the professors? Whereas in the industry, you know, how do we please our customers? Of course, you know, we don't want a guy like this, you know, yelling at the phone as our customer at the other end. So it's all about, you know, pleasing the customers. So the mindset, you can see that, you know, it is completely different when we move uh, from a student life to uh, becoming a practicing engineer.
So I would like to point out that typically, you know, there are like four stages in a career development. You know, the first stage we can see that you know it's more about learning and, and training, where we are learning a lot of things. There is no level of contribution, and then people are you know allowed to make mistakes because we are still learning things, and the person is being mentored. Then when we move to stage two, the person is reasonably trained and then starts to make high level of contribution and then starting to become more of a technical expert. And then you could see that the person becomes more independent as well. And then, then imagine you're entering the third stage. Maybe by third stage, you know, we may be out of being a young professional possibly. Uh, third stage is more like you know a broadening where the person is training other people as a broader level of contribution and also is able to lead several experts and then influences people influences making decisions and builds relationships and then the fourth stage we can see that the person has in you know, a lot more years of experience uh, becomes like an industry leader uh, who creates a vision and then leads the leaders and ends up you know being a CTO or a CEO. So typically I mean this is what happens in, in, in any any career development where we go from you know one stage to the next stage with individual individual contribution, then with a broadening experience and then uh, becomes a really a visionary. So how do we, you know, define a star? You know, the star we can say that are better problem solvers and creative. You know, also the stars are also, you know, very driven and, and ambitious. And typically, you know, we can see that the stars are much start, smarter, and they also have the will to succeed. But the age-old question is, you know, are the stars born? Or made. So now let me jump into you know some of the traits which could help us to become a, a star engineer. You know, let me start with the alphabet A. You know, the first one is attitude. Let's look at you know how this plays a key role in molding us to become a star engineer. You know, engineering is, you know, typically it consists of you know, achieving a result which is really based on, you know, decisions plus actions. So in order to take a decision and action, you know, the attitude is very important. We always hear about, you know, people having a bad attitude. And we always, you know, hear about uh, Mr. Murphy, you know, who always says that something can go wrong, you know, so don't be the guy who will be Mr. Murphy. So they all, you know, they also say that always and never are the two words that you always remember never to use it. So having a good attitude to do things is very important to be successful. You know, also it is it's not you know what you say, but how you do it is very important. Now, people also say that you know well done is actually better than well said. You know, also we need to have the tenacity to follow through with any of our work, because oftentimes you know we can see that you know people will forget how fast we did the job, but they will always remember how well we did it. I'm sure a lot of you may be familiar with this quotation you know, where our attitude more than our aptitude you know, determines our altitude. So the key thing is you know, having a good attitude to do things that definitely sets us apart. 
And the next one I could think of, you know, is passion. You know, the, the enthusiasm really spells the difference between mediocrity and accomplishment. And they say that, you know, the pleasure in the job puts the perfection in the work. So whatever we do, if we are passionate about it, then that goes a long way in getting things done. Also, you know, passion is important to make something successful. Uh, they say that, you know, the failure happens because of two things, really. That doing things without thinking about them is one. And then thinking about things without doing them is another one. So these two things, you know, would contribute to a failure. Whereas if you have the passion, you know, then these two things will not happen. Also, you know, a lot of things, all things are difficult before they become easy. So it's very important, you know, to seek out responsibility, which is above and beyond what is expected. You know, oftentimes people say that we have to be proactive and it also take the ownership and responsibility to do things. Since this webinar is organized by IEEE, I thought I can come up with a different acronym for IEEE along these lines, you know, where we need to have, you know, integrated excellence in enthusiastic execution. So this is again another uh, you know, famous quote by Einstein, where he says, and I have no special talents. I'm only passionately curious. They say that in you know, a curiosity killed the cat, but hopefully not that curiosity will not kill the cat in engineering. And the next one you know, I could think of is ha having a big picture. Oftentimes, in old days at least, the engineers were considered to have you know, a depth of knowledge only in one field. We can see that you know, that view is changing now. I mean, people are becoming experts in multidisciplinary things. I mean, a lot of things require knowledge in several areas. Uh, that's why you know, they say that someone should be like a T-shaped inverter, a T-shaped innovator. Uh, you know, that's what I meant as you know, tall and fat as opposed to tall and thin, which means you know you have expertise in one area and then a broad level of expertise in other skills like teamwork and communication skills. So it is good to have you know a broader knowledge at the same time having expertise in one field. And you can see that you know several companies also hire people with there are different levels of skills, like companies like Google and Apple, of course, uh, hire people with a different set of skills to design things. And also, you know, it is very important to have, you know, the project, customer, and competitor perspective when we design things, as opposed to just designing things in, in, in vacuum, really. So, in some of the quote by uh, Alexander Granville is, you know, leave the beaten track occasionally and dive into the woods. Uh, in, in getting this big picture, I would like to share you know, another anecdote. Some of you may be familiar with the magazine EDN. Uh, EDN publishes a column uh, regularly, which is called as you know, Tales from the Cube, where uh, they publish articles from uh, engineers, uh, where the engineers share some of the very interesting problems they have solved. Uh, one of the um, articles that I read uh, a while ago uh, is very interesting how the engineer was able to think outside the box to solve the problem. Uh, Aromatic test equipment company had uh, installed a machine in one of the customer's location. Uh, what happened was uh, like within two weeks of the installation, that company was calling the ATE uh, manufacturer saying that that equipment was not working. Uh, so the ATE company was very puzzled because it is a new machine. Uh, how come you know it was not working within two weeks? 
So they sent this engineer uh, who went there, who was trying to analyze this problem for a while, for a day, and uh, he could not uh, figure out what is going on because the mission is new and what happened was the mission was uh, was not working properly. Uh, then the next day he no started noticing that a lot of people were going on a coffee break uh, in the afternoon around 3 p.m. And then at that time he noticed that that's when the machine, the automatic test equipment machine was not working. Then he immediately he started looking at the power supply with the oscilloscope and he got the idea. The problem was after that company had installed the automatic test equipment, the coffee vendor had installed the coffee machines in the same aisle. So there was power supply interference with the automatic test equipment because they did not really use a good uh, filtering for the supply. Once he changed that filter, everything started working. You know, so this clearly tells that you know, he, because he was thinking outside the box and he was creative, he was able to solve this problem. Uh, whereas if we had just focused on just on the automatic test equipment hardware and the software, he may not have been able to solve this problem. So in, in EDN, you know, you'll come across a lot of these very interesting stories, you know, called as the Tales from the Cube, which solve very interesting problems. So if you haven't looked at it, I suggest that it may be a good idea to uh, uh, look at those columns to get some ideas. Again, uh, I have to share another quotation by Einstein that, you know, which clearly shows thinking outside the box, that, you know, we can't really solve the problems using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And engineering is, you know, paying attention to details. So the next big one I would say is, you know, diligence. So this is very important in getting things done. We all hear about, you know, the carpenter's rule, you know, which is measure twice and cut once. And if we believe too much, then we, know, we will not notice faults. And if you doubt too much, we will never make progress. And you may have seen this uh, picture, you know, how the, 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 this was really built somewhere, I'm, I'm not sure, but this kind of, you know, shows how, you know, if we don't have diligence in what we do, you know, this is what will happen. Uh, here, uh, for diligence, and I would like to share uh, a couple of anecdotes as well as uh, my personal experience. Uh, one of the first trips that I did uh, many years ago was, you know, we had a power on reset in our chip. Uh, we, you know, it was all simulated well, and then the chip came back, but it was you know, dead on arrival. It turned out that, you know, the person who simulated the power on reset he simulated with the wrong polarity, actually. You know, I think it was active, active low, I believe. Uh, but then, you know, he simulated the power reset being active high. So the chip was really dead on arrival. I mean, there was nothing wrong. But then, you know, just a simulation, he assumed the wrong polarity. So now that shows that, you know, diligence is very important to be successful. And then, you know, there are also several uh, epic engineering failures which are due to you know lack of uh, diligence uh, one of the examples you know I'm, I'm sure a lot of you may have heard of uh, this mars uh, climate orbiter which is which is a robot uh, space probe uh, launched by nasa in the uh, late 90s uh, it actually entered a low altitude and crash that's because you know the software was in metric newtons but the ground crew entered in pounds, uh, pounds per force. So, of course, you know, Matt, in, in Canada, you guys won't have the problem because you've gone metric. Uh, so, the metric mix up was a factor of four difference, and that's how, you know, it ended up in a low altitude and crashed. Uh, you know, that shows, and again, diligence. And I'm sure that a lot of 
as we have heard about the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, uh, you may have heard that there are a lot of delays with the Dreamliner, but anyway, it was all done. Uh, but the interesting thing is the biggest problem in the assembling of the Dreamliner was from the smallest parts, which was really the fasteners. You know, the fasteners would not fit, and that was one of the biggest problems they had during the assembly. And then there are also you know, other examples where uh, you know, another uh, the rocket launched by the European Space Agency you know, crashed um, because it, was, it had a, a software issue again, you know, which had a 64-bit into a 16-bit, which where the overflow happened. You know, these are some of the anecdotes where it shows that diligence is very important to make things successful. So another quote by Jack Welch, you know, do not pursue glory, pursue excellence. So pursuing excellence is being diligent. And then now let me move on to some of the soft skills which are really needed to succeed. You know, one is, you know, the communication skills. They say that in US, you know, the Congress can make anyone a general, but he or she can become a commander only through communication. So it's very important to have you know, both oral and written skills with communication. Also, the listening skills are also very important. Uh, here, you know, I would like to point out one of the anecdotes, uh, a lot of you may, you may have heard of you know the Challenger disaster, uh, the space shuttle, which happened in uh, early 80s. Uh, what happened was there was a problem with the, the rocket O-rings. The company which designed that, you know, Martin Theopold, uh, probably they don't exist now. But the, the engineers knew that there was a problem with those O-rings, but they were not able to you know articulate that well before the launch of the space shuttle i mean they had all the details and everything but the way they presented they did not really clearly communicate the issue and then the launch happened and it uh, turned out to be a major disaster in, in the space uh, space program so it's very important to have you know good written and oral communication also, listening is very important. Oftentimes, you know, we do not listen to understand, but we listen to reply. So it's very important that we listen to understand. This is a quote by Plato. I mean, wise men talk because they have something to say. Fools because they have to say something. And another important soft skill to have is teamwork. You know, these days, it is really a global workforce. Whereas when I started uh, with at and I mean, all of our group was in the same hallway. And pretty much the whole group was in next to each other in two or three offices. Whereas now, you know, that is no longer the case. You know, the, it's all a global team, with teams spread out. Uh, throughout throughout the world uh, to have a pretty much a 24-hour design cycle. So it's very important that we work together as a team. And it's a famous quote by Ford, you know, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is success. So it's very important to have a good teamwork. Also, you know, I would like to point out another example. You may have heard of the dream team, you know, the basketball team, the U.S. basketball team. When they first started allowing the NBA players to play in the Olympics, the first team was called as a dream team. Dream team had all the star NBA players. Though each one was individually good, that Olympics in the U.S. did not win because they did not really play together as a team. But of course, you know, that changed in the later Olympics. 
and you know you started winning the medal in the later Olympics. So it is very important to play together as a team. So it is a quote by Michael Jordan. It says you know the talent wins games, but only teamwork wins championships. So there is a famous SEAL team saying you know, individuals play the game, but teams beat the odds. Of course, you know, we don't want to feel the teamwork like this, you know, the famous Randy Glassbergen cartoon. Another soft skill which is really needed is networking. Of course, you know, IEEE provides a lot of opportunities for networking. And we really need to know, you know, who knows the thing. We really can't be a lone wolf to solve all the problems ourselves. You know, whereas 20 years ago, a couple of us could design a chip, everything from start to finish. Whereas these days, that is not possible. I mean, everything has become so specialized. So we really need to know who really knows certain things so that we don't have to be reinventing that wheel. Also, we need to seek help from the gurus and not really the forecasters. They say that mastery is the ability to make things which is complex appear simple and easily understood. So that is very important. And we have to be very resourceful to solve the problems. Also, we have to be a you know, consensus builder and uh, never burn the bridges. So in this quote, it says, you know, a charlatan makes obscure what is clear, whereas a thinker makes clear what is obscure. And that is what is important. So the National Academy of Engineering they came up with the attributes for an engineer uh, in 2020. I, I believe they came up with this uh, several years ago, where you know he, you can see uh, Bill Gates, Gordon Moore, and others. Uh, when they came up with this, you know, one missing. I'm, I'm surprised that the uh, person who is missing in this is you know Steve Jobs. I mean, Steve Jobs was still alive when they made this. Uh, personally, I felt that I think they should have put jobs for creativity. It's again my personal opinion. So, in summary, you know, we did look at what are some of the traits which are needed to become a star engineer. We can say that. You know, maybe we can look at like you know three categories. Uh, if I look at it as three categories, you know, we can say a handyman, genius, and a math scientist. You know, we all know a handyman. You know, a handyman brings attention to details and craftsmanship to the job that needs to be done. You know, difficult to live without, uh, but a household name, not a very famous name. And then if you look at geniuses. Like Edison and Ford, you know, they relentlessly tried one after the other until an elusive solution is found. And then a mad scientist, you know, Tesla, uh, maybe even Jobs, we can put in the category in that category, who are idiosyncratic and irrational, and then until magic appears. So all of us, I think that you know, may have the attributes of each one, you know, to be a handyman, you know, to be a genius and to be a mad scientist and maybe excel in one of them. So some of the traits which could help us achieve that is you know, the attitude. Having a good attitude sets the trend, really. And then being passionate about doing things. You know, because the creativity is directly proportional to the time that we think about our work. And sweat the details about our work rather than sweating on the small stuff. So we always have to be you know, enthusiastic 
and passionate. And the third one is, you know, having a big picture of things. You know, that really helps to put a perspective on achieving the results, having a big picture. And of course, it has to be followed by diligence to the details. And the other skills, obviously, are, you know, some of the soft skills. Communication is very important, both written and oral, followed by teamwork and networking. And of course, IEEE provides a lot of opportunities for networking. So if we follow all this, uh, I'm sure that, you know, we all can become a star performer and become a superhero of an engineer. And that concludes my uh, presentation. Thank you, um, Nagy, for an excellent webinar on how to be um, a, a star engineer. Uh, uh, we, we we actually have a lot of questions um, uh, coming in, so um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna start off the um, the discussion um, with uh, John with John from the Falkland Islands. Um, he made the comment, "Good point on keeping customers happy. However, this method does not necessarily work. Many companies." are spending resources internally to keep productivity high within the company. A customer's always right approach can lead to job dissatisfaction. Um, do you have any comments on that? Or, or I guess I guess what John is trying to ask is, is um, companies are now focusing less on the consumer and trying to keep productivity high. Uh, and that obviously leads to job, job uh, dissatisfaction. So any, any comments? Uh, um, I mean, the... If you can repeat uh, one more time, I'm sorry. We are trying to keep the companies are trying to keep the productivity high and not paying attention to the customers or, or the other yes. drivers. No, yeah, the, you know, he that's that that was the comment made. So maybe you can you can comment on that uh, in, in in terms of your own personal experiences. Yeah, it is. Uh, I I agree. I mean, you know, it is always a balance uh, with that. I I do agree that you know like, uh, sometimes I mean. They are trying to please the customers. I mean, they say that the customer is always right, uh, but again, you know, that may not be the uh, the case. I mean, if you look at, you know, even some of the Apple products, right? I mean, none of the customers probably knew that they want they want an iPhone or they want a phone with a camera, right? Uh, so they were able to design things, and then when it was given to the customers, you know, they all liked it. So. Um, That's a good point. Yeah, you know, so it's kind of a balance. Uh, oftentimes, I mean, it is uh, di difficult to say that uh, the, the customer is. Uh, it's again depends on the customer. I think you know, the customer is a very big customer. Then it, it poses a challenge on balancing that. Uh, I, I'm I'm sure that not not every company could do the same thing, uh, which is which is a challenging thing. Okay, um, moving on to the next question, Anand from India. He makes the comment, good, good webinar. Uh, where would you suggest to get more training on, on the soft skills you mentioned in your talk? I mean, I, again, you know, I took young professionals, you know, you, you are organizing a lot of these things. Right? I mean, you also pointed yes. out a couple of them. And I'm sure that a lot of companies also do this. <coughs> Oh, yeah, that, uh, that is a good play. IEEE is an excellent uh, resource to, to, to get some soft skills. So uh, one more question. Uh, another question from Najim from Saudi Arabia. I'm a young electrical engineer working in, the cons work, working in construction projects. I find it sometimes very difficult to learn and master different fields such as control and power in very short time. How can we young professionals increase our learning curve? Um, I, I, again, I, I, mean, I would like to again go back to you know what IEEE uh, offers, right? Um, uh, IEEE offers like for very many of these, uh, so say solid state circuits or electron devices society, the various society chapters, uh, they have started doing a lot of webinars. Um, I'm not particularly sure about the control system related area, but I'm sure. Uh, they may also have, I mean, I know that the Solid State Circuits and Electron Devices Society, uh, they have webinars. In fact, if you go to the IEEE uh, website and then go to the various societies 
pages. Uh, all these webinars are listed. And if, uh, but I believe you have to be a member. Uh, you just have to be an IEEE member, I think. I'm, I'm not sure whether you have to be a member of the society. I'm not sure. And these webinars are also uh, recorded. Uh, so which we can even watch it at a later time. So I would suggest that maybe that may be a good resource uh, to learn some of the things. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the comment of going to uh, IEEE sections um, and then uh, societies where you can get more specialized and more uh, information on your own interests or, 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 or your, your company's interests is, is an excellent um, uh, resource. Uh, a really interesting question uh, from India coming in. Um, how do you work with a demotivated team if it becomes a necessity? So how do you how do you how do you increase motivation within a team and to actually achieve your uh, goals up, up better? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> tough, tough questions. Yeah, it is. It is a tough. Uh, it is a tough, uh, tough question. Tough we way. actually we actually have the, uh, a similar question from uh, Eduardo from the United States. Uh, again, basically on motivation. How do we how do we, how do young engineers? Get motivated, get excited about um, what they're actually uh, studying and what and and what their what their uh, jobs are going to be um, uh, in the years to come. So the, right. the like, like uh, topic of motivation. <laughs> right, right. I mean, so it, it's very interesting, very very, very, very uh, tough question. But you know, what I can, you know, I, I remember hearing a saying, you know, where I think somebody said, "You got to light the fire in the belly and not light the fire under the chair." If you know what I mean, you know. Yes. So yes. If, you put the, you know, if you put the fire under the chair of somebody, that is not going to motivate them. I mean, you got to light that fire in their belly. Uh, so, which means, you know, the, you, you got to create the uh, somehow motivate. You know, not through fear, right? I mean, that that that's what uh, the analogy was trying to say. I think. Whereas, if you motivate. If people become passionate about doing things, then things become easier. Whereas, if there is um, if there is fear of you know of not doing certain things, then you know maybe people lose the interest. Uh, you know that's what I I, I could th think of. I mean, again, you know, motivation again is is pretty much like a more like a personal one, right? I mean, it is very yes. difficult to. Uh, the people have to feel within themselves, you know, interested with something. Right? Then, uh, then people will be, you know, concerned. That's what I even I mentioned earlier in one of the slides that if you're thinking, you know, if you're thinking a lot of time uh, about your work uh, and sweating on the details, then it becomes easier. Whereas if you are sweating the small stuff, like you know, the question is asking, which is sweating on the little things. Then I think we become demotivated. Right, right. So how so steering, like steering the topic? Uh, yeah. Perfect. Steering the topic uh, a bit. Like how would how would you comment? Could you comment on maybe how how to keep your yourself engaged personally? So we have some comments coming in in terms of uh, how how do what can students do right now after they've lost engagement? How how can they uh, what 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 can they do to actually regain that personal engagement in terms of uh, electrical engineering courses or or even in the workplace? Um, really like how do you how do you keep yourself engaged every day from day to day? Yeah. <laughs> that, that, I, you know what, what I could again you know, I don't want to be pitch, pitching in more again for I mean I have to draw uh, things from I to believe only. Uh, because an IEEE is offering a lot of things even at the, the section level, right? I mean, like various talks are offered, uh, various uh, like one day symposiums are offered. And then even if someone is not, say, working in that field, uh, sometimes when you attend those things, you, 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 you get some ideas, you know, a spark of idea yes. comes. And then you may end up using that in your work. I mean, you may not be exactly working in that field, but then, you know, listening to that idea from a different perspective, you may be able to tap into that idea to use it in your work. So that's what I, you know I, I could think of. You know, that way, 
if you attend various things, you know, that also helps with networking. Uh, but at the same time, like as I gave an analogy of, you know, like a T-shaped innovator, where one may start to gain expertise in, in various fields. I mean, if there are, uh, so imagine, you know, even uh, coming up with a good uh, design, right? I mean, aesthetic design, we may not be thinking about that if you are just doing things on our own, but then when you see uh, like Apple products or, or way Google has built the website, you may be starting to view things differently to bring in that simplicity in our work as well. Perfect. So just to, just to end off with one last question um, from Jessica from the United States. Uh, so you talk about you talked a little about uh, uh, a little about uh, communication skills in your in your in your webinar, and um, Jessica gives the scenario where uh, you know uh, 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 she was a great speaker or just great speakers in general have 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 this sense of confidence, but um, every once in a while you get asked a question that. Uh, Kind of uh, makes you lose some of your confidence, and then and then and then you blank in front of a, a crowd, a lecture, whatever it may be. Um, do you have any suggestions for gaining that confidence uh, uh, back for future for future talks? Um, again, again, uh, not uh, uh, again uh, in front of a lecture or or whatever it may be. Do you have any in, in, any tips in terms of um, in, in terms of that situation? Uh, um, you know, I I would say that in a situation like that. Personally, you know, my, what I would think is one could, you know, simply say if they, if they don't know the answer, uh, the best way to say is, okay, you know, uh, I, uh, you know, at this time I, I don't know exactly, you know, I'll, I'll get back to you or something like that. Uh, whereas what happens is if we try to uh, kind of show as if maybe we know the answer, then maybe we may get into trouble. So it is maybe good to be uh, upfront. And and then say that okay I'll, I'll get back or something like that and then get back uh, get back to them at a later time. That way, uh, you know, the person who asks the question also understands that this the speaker is very genuine and trying to uh, find an answer. Now that will give more time rather than uh, trying to show. That. A lot of times I think we maybe get personally uh, upset with us thinking. That we have to, we don't want to obviously look. Uh, you know, I don't want to use the word. Uh, we don't, not so smart or something like that. So maybe that fear causes that anxiety, and then maybe we may end up saying something. But maybe it's good to be just upfront and just say, "I'll find the answer." Yes. Uh, you know, maybe if I can share, you know, another uh, another anecdote. I mean, you may have some of you may have heard of this story. Uh, about Einstein, uh, if I can share that you know, quickly. Uh, so the Einsteins, you know, Einstein was giving lectures uh, in several places, right? So the limo driver always went with him. Uh, so when, wherever Einstein gave the lecture, the limo driver was also uh, listening to that. So one day, you know, he told Einstein, you know, you've been giving this lecture, I've been coming everywhere. Yeah, now I feel that I know, I know, you know, what whatever you're talking about. I, I want to give this lecture you know, next time. Uh, so Einstein agrees to it. Uh, you know, I don't know whether this is an urban legend or whether a real story. I'm not sure. Uh, so Einstein agrees, and uh, so the next time I think, uh, he, uh, you know, Einstein is in the driver's seat, and then uh, you know the, the limo driver is in the back seat. He goes and gives the lecture. Um, then somebody asks him uh, that question. Somebody asks him a question. He turns around and he says, "Oh, what type of a question is this?" Even a driver can answer this question, and then he finds to Einstein. <laughs> excellent, excellent antidote. Um, uh, so we actually have a, 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 another another question from the Netherlands. Uh, however, current current jobs require almost full dedication, leaving little to no room for personal life. Hence, work to live and not live to work is 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 now becoming. Um, uh, Doubtful. So again, maybe the comment on on, on work-life balance, uh, which which you did touch on a little bit, maybe, maybe expanding just a just a little bit more. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, that is uh, yes, that is a problem. You know, I mean, all all of us are struggling with that. Um, I am not sure, you know, if there is an easy way for that. Um, 
whereas in old days it was it was you know the, the old movie we had like nine to five and things like that. I don't think anybody works nine to five anymore uh, since because of the global nature of our things. We are having conference call in the night or early in the morning. Uh, the customers are in a different continent, and then the design teams are also spread across. Uh, it is a challenge, you know. I'm, I'm not sure how uh, uh, how to manage that one. Yeah. So I think uh, I think I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the questions out, out there. There was a comment on on why. Um, uh, people should become uh, IEEE uh, members past past uh, uh, the student member grade, but I'm going to be talking about that in 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 a little bit. Uh, Nagy, um, thank you for for giving such an engaging and engaging um, um, webinar. Uh, it's probably the most participation we've had uh, year to date uh, once we started um, once we started the webinar. Many questions, good, very good discussion. So again, thank you for such an engaging um, uh, webinar. Yeah, yeah, thank you, uh, Matt. I I'd like to really thank you and uh, Mario and the IEEE Young Professionals for organizing this. And I would also like to thank you know all the participants uh, from different parts, maybe at different time zones. And uh, thank you all, and thank you for all your questions uh, as well. Thank you very much. Perfect. So uh, thank you all for participating. Um, please c complete the feedback survey. I will be uh, uh, sending out in the, uh, in within the uh, next hour or so. Um, our next Young Professional webinar is on October 3rd at 10 a.m. Curry Actiskin is going to be uh, talking about uh, working with difficult uh, people uh, and an overview of that. And this is part of a webinar series that um, uh, he's been putting together uh, uh, for us uh, for 2014. Uh, going back to the comment on why should you uh, be a uh, IEEE member beyond uh, the student member grade. We offer tons of career-based services. Uh, I mentioned before the Mentor Center and the Resume Lab. Nagy even talked about some today uh, about getting getting that experience, getting that networking throughout the many societies that IEEE has. Uh, all excellent reasons uh, for becoming a uh, you know, IEEE Young Professional uh, a member. Again, the Mentor Center, we uh, we put you in contact with a mentor that can help you guide uh, guide you through the many uh, uh, career transitions young professionals have. Resume Lab, you can uh, many tips and tricks um, uh, for the uh, of, to make your resume uh, great. Uh, suggestions for other young professionals' projects and services, please email us at the email shown there, and of, of course um, join us on Facebook uh, on our website uh, and, and and LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, uh, all, all modes of communication. Um, from that, I would like to thank everyone for uh, participating. Uh, uh, please join us for our young, uh, uh, young professional webinar uh, again in October. Uh, and thank you all for participating. Thank you very much. Bye bye.